Thank you for joining the Once Changing the World, which is India's first Future Tech meets Sustainability podcast. And today I'm delighted and honored to have with me Mr. Jonathan Brill, who is a writer, speaker, and advisor on how to create, manage, and turn radical change to your advantage. He's the author of Rogue Waves, Future Proof of Your Business, To Survive and Profit from Radical Change, which was the number two selling economics book in China. He's the ex global futurist at HP, senior fellow at HBR's China New Growth Institute, and board advisor at Frost and Sullivan. So, really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast. The intro is something which I pull out the net. Will be really cool if you could start with a small brief introduction. Sure. So, as you said,、uh, my name is Jonathan Brill. I was a global futurist at HP. I spend a lot of time、uh, these days writing about how to survive and profit from radical change. I also work with with a broad range of organizations, from from startups to the Fortune 50,、uh, to to government organizations, to help. Figure out exactly those questions. What are the small decisions we can make today? Often, often things that don't cost any more to radically improve our possibilities tomorrow. And it turns out、uh, that there's a tremendous amount we can do. And and it's it's as much a mindset shift as it is、uh, a strategic shift in our businesses. It's something we can all do, whether we're we're small group managers、uh, or whether we're CEOs. Right. So you you mentioned that it's a mindset shift. So how do you how do you make that mindset shift? You know, because、uh, at at least till till COVID, I think you know most of the businesses used to talk about digital transformation, but there was not much action. But today, I think you know we've been catapulted or thrusted into a digital world where every businesses, I think, has to be digital. You know, and if not, I think they'll be left behind. So, how 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 do you make these changes? What what would be your、uh, advice, or where where do these businesses start from? So, the way I think about what's happening right now in all of our organizations is that we're removing、uh, the the middle office, the middle management layer,、uh, as quickly as we can for for a number of reasons. One, they're expensive. To they they tend to limit agility、uh, in certain types of organizations in certain types of ways, right? We've looked at the cost impact. Oh, we're going to save a pile of money. We're going to be more agile as we digitize the, those tasks. But what we haven't considered is that、um, when you increase the span of control at junior levels of your organization, even though people might not be managing more people. Uh, they need to have much better critical thinking skills. They need to understand policy. They need to understand the external impact of their internal decisions. They need to understand the organization-wide impact of their decisions. What I'm suggesting is that you know we need to give our soldiers, we need to give the junior people in our organization. Yeah, you know, the same critical thinking skills, the same decision making skills, the same executive judgment as our senior leadership teams, and we haven't invested in that properly. We haven't built that competency properly, and I believe the biggest challenge and the biggest opportunity for all of the 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 the, the extended reality, the virtual reality, the, the the AI tools that you're such a big fan of, right? The big opportunity. Is to rapidly teach those types of competencies through simulation, right? Through using those tools, the the AR, VR, AI tools, to to think through a broad range of possibilities and their implications. Uh, uh, Jonathan, can you expand on, on this a little bit? And I mean, the role of tech. In、uh, you know future businesses, and you mentioned that the middle. Layer management layer is being、uh, removed, you know, because of various reasons, and and these、uh, workers should have critical critical thinking skills and so on and so forth. There is various dynamics which is being played out, you know, especially today, you know, because of the accelerating technologies such as AI and things like that. Because at one point in time, I think you know most of us used to do a, a, a certain skill, but you know all of the tech, all of those tasks are being automated. 
Mm-hmm. You, you know, we have things like generative AI and stuff like that, because, you know, at one point in time, you actually, you know, do most of your work, but then this is being outsourced to an AI right. model. And, and so is your design. You know, there's things like st- st- uh, stable diffusion, mid journey and things like that. And one point in time, you actually thought that, you know, creativity would not be touched by AI, but even, even that's, that's, uh, you know, the, the lines are getting blurred. So, so, so maybe elaborate on, you know, the role of this tech stack that you mentioned, possibly AI, AR, VR, MR, and how, how is this going to impact businesses? So, so I think there are two things that are happening, right? One is uh, that these tools are able to do something that looks a lot like creativity, right? But creativity without critical thinking. And so you can create a thing using generative AI that sounds really good, sounds really compelling, right? But my friend, David Rose, who's a famous entrepreneur in the New York area, you know, he went to find out all about himself and he was found out he was married to an investor named Esther Dyson. It's a very famous technology investor in the New York area. They're not married, right? So, so, so these things that sound super compelling, right? Oh yeah, these two high power people. Like I know, I know one of them, and 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 I, I was a little surprised, but I was like, oh, that totally makes sense. She's older though. She's older than David. That's weird, but it totally passed me by, right? If you have creativity without critical thinking you end up with nonsense. And the challenge with these things is yes, they remove many of the craft challenges of producing things that look creative, but they don't remove the need for critical thinking and and testing what's actually being said. And so the question when we look at these automation tools is are they helping us think better or are they helping us look like we're thinking better? I do understand the point of view that uh, creativity without critical thinking is is, is possibly the, the the maybe not the right approach. But I think, at least of what we're seeing, I think machines are getting very credible at doing some really cool things. And that's the reason I guess some of the largest businesses, Microsoft is leveraging, you, you, you know, Bing is the, so, so, so there, there's, where, where do you see that, you know, at least from a common man's perspective, mm-hmm. it, 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 it's like, oh, this, this hype, cycle of generative AI and everything is going to be really disruptive to society. So somebody who's been invested in the space, what what are your broader perspective? Because you gave me like, like a small, this thing, what are your broader perspective on this? Where does this, where does this go in the near future? To be clear, you know, I'm a big fan of generative AI and, and I agree with you about the, the, the labor product, the productivity impact of, of, generative AI. So uh, I wrote an article a couple of weeks ago for Forbes that uh, would have taken me about 30 hours to write without uh, ChatGPT. With the support of ChatGPT, it took me an evening. So we're talking about a 10 times increase in productivity, right? But it's because I'm also a high, I'm a highly skilled writer, right? So I wasn't asking it to do the writing for me. I was asking it to, to, to give me some, some contrast to my thinking. And that's what the value was. Now, when we take a look at what is the impact of, of something like uh, ChatGPT, right? Or, or a GPT-4, right? The, the, the thing that Microsoft is invested in. And, and the ability of all of these technologies to do better than humans at a lot of things, right? So the, 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 um, there've been a number of benchmarks about like college testing, you know, graduate school testing for, for law school and medical school and whatnot. And, you know, it's really clear that for the things that, that, uh, GPT is not good enough at, like in two years, right. It's going to be better than any human student at answering these test questions. Right. So the question's going to be, okay, can you, can you give it, can you ask the question in the right way to get the right answer is going to be the, the 
the thing that's important. But the, the challenge to me with all of these tools has to do with, with something called labor productivity. So in economics, there, there's a thing, and I get, I get geeky here for a second, I'm sorry. <laughs> there's a thing called the solo residual, which is, which is how you calculate the value of innovation in an economy. And it's basically once you remove everything else, how much, how much money was left, you know, how much additional money was left. As technology accelerates, you see this very interesting challenge where, where innovation happens faster than you're able to monetize it. And so while we all may be getting dramatically more productive, we may not be getting dramatically more profitable. So labor productivity, which is, which is the way you calculate the solo residual, is literally the, 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 the amount of money earned per hour worked. Now, even if you get 10 times more done in that hour, if you aren't actually earning more money per hour worked, we have a foundational challenge in our economy. And when I think about something like ChatGPT that takes somebody who's spent 25 years trying to become a skilled thinker and a skilled writer, um, all of a sudden, that work, that 30 hours of work that I used to bill for is done in three hours. And, and maybe five years from now, done by someone much lower skilled than me. Right? This is a real challenge in terms of how our economy works, how labor productivity, how, how growth through innovation, economic growth through innovation works. I, I guess you brought a very interesting point that as soon as um, when these technology grows, monetization becomes a problem. And I think we're seeing that. Uh, if, if, but that also is reflected to the democratization of technology because at one point in time, what maybe only a few you know, possibly group of people or a certain section of society could uh, leverage those tools. Today, these tools are being democratization. So could you possibly speak to you know that? So there are two sides of what's happening. One, uh, one is what concerns me as someone who's invested a career on being a thought leader. The second is the value to everybody else, right? What's the value? There, there are maybe... 500, 1,000 people in the world who can do what I do, right? Uh, maybe. Uh, if three years from now, everybody can do what I do, that's probably a good thing for the world. It's not a good thing for me. Um, so I'm excited about this democratization from the big picture, right? I'm really excited about it. I think it's, it's the most thing, perhaps the most exciting thing that's happened in human history. The challenge is if you can do these things, can you use them effectively? Right. The fact that 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 you know, uh, you know, I can paint like Rembrandt. Right. Doesn't mean that I'm going to be able to to use that painting effectively. Right. The fact that I can be a better graphic designer than someone like Saul Bass, right, by using AI doesn't necessarily mean that I'm going to have a message that's worth communicating effectively. The fact that I can, I can have ChatGPT write a, a, a blog post that's compelling and eloquent doesn't mean that I'm going to add to the, the, the human conversation. And so, so there's this, this, this challenge I think going back to this, this idea of creativity and critical thinking that we need to raise the bar on both simultaneously. Right. Yeah. So, so I, I completely get that because I think we, yes, we are getting into a world where the lines are getting going to get more and more blurred hey, from the professionals to, to mm -hmm. the ones who leverage these tools effectively through engineering prompts and, and, and things like that, because that itself is, is becoming a profession. So somebody who's been deeply vested in the future, would you kind of like have maybe like a crystal ball of sorts, you know, who would be kind, kind of be, be able to like predict what, 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 what would this future look like? You know, where, where these, all of these lines are getting like very blurred. Yeah. Th there are two trends, two, two tensions that, that are, are, conflicting right one this mass democratization of thinking right uh 
The second, and, and you know, these things that you used to have to have a PhD to do, right? Now, now you can actually ask GPT-4, chat GPT, whichever tool is going to be in six months from now to, 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 to help you solve a chemistry problem or a protein folding problem or some, some insanely complex thing, right? That's absolutely amazing, right? The, the second piece is that these tools are very expensive to produce and to maintain. Right, you need data centers to do this stuff, and 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 so the reality is that while the thinking is getting democratized, the the the, the center of gravity, the point of control, is getting consolidated. Right, so the the the, the Microsofts of the worlds, the Googles of the worlds, the 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 the, the Alibabas of the world, the, uh, you know, BAAI, which is the the Beijing Artificial Intelligence Institute, uh, Baidu these organizations are going to have a, a, a much stronger hold on the future, you know, and, 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 and be able to charge for the value of what they're able to do, which is make us superhuman. Right. And so, so we have this, 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 this challenge of, of we're going to be much more innovative. Uh, and at the same time, uh, the cost of that is, is not, we buy education or we spend our time on education and then we're able to do things. It's that we outsource that time and we outsource that, that, that purchase of knowledge to, to, you know, Microsoft and, and they charge us on subscription. And so what, what does that look like? The second challenge that I see, you know, moving into the 21st century, the next 15 years is that, you know, India, China, United States, the EU will move to a close to parity on, on these technologies. And in that world, uh, it's going to be very difficult to maintain the sort of the trade relations that we've had over the last 25 years, 50 years, where, you know, the US, you know, because of its post-World War II position is kind of at the top of the stack. China's moving up the stack. The EU doesn't know what it's doing. It still thinks it's got colonies um, and is becoming increasingly irrelevant. Uh, and India, you know, is, is moving up that stack too. In a world where you, in, in, in Japan's, you know, doing whatever Japan does, but, but in that world, where the, the, the relationships uh, in terms of the ability to produce new knowledge are closer and closer and closer to equivalent in the, the top 20 economies in the world, certainly the top eight. Um, you end up with a situation where, where the, the current global system, the current global order is not sustainable because you don't have innovation importers and exporters anymore everyone's exporting innovation. And so, and so the entire economic system has to, has to reorganize around that. Could, could you maybe talk a little bit more about that? Yes, because there's some major dynamics being played out, you know, especially I think between China and US, you know, because with China becoming a superpower, you know, uh, and America has been, you, you know, always been that global superpower, which we've all looked at, but, you know, there, there is the, that country, which, which is, you know, rising up rapidly. And, and, and so, so is possibly the, uh, the, the Indian economy is growing. So in, in the, in this changing dynamic, how is the world going to get impacted? You know, because how is it going to pan out and affect the entire world? And possibly maybe, maybe you could address the metaverse also. Yeah. <laughs> and, and the, the U S China and the metaverse. Uh, okay. So what we're seeing right now between the U S and China is effectively that China is becoming an innovation exporter. Right, that their their patent production has been on a pretty their high quality what's called triadic patent production has been on a pretty straightforward curve since about two thousand, uh, sometime between now and let's call it twenty thirty, uh, they will be producing more high quality what are called triadic utility patents uh, than the United States. 
Well, what does that world look like? Uh, the second thing that is happening is a scramble for resources. And as, as India continues its development, it will get much more intense. So we're seeing uh, you know, competition uh, for, for around water resources starting to happen in, in, on, on the border between India and China. Oh, um, that kind of thing will get more intense. Uh, you'll continue to see more intensity around that uh, in Southeast Asia. Uh, especially around control of, of uh, water resources from the Himalayas uh, all the way down through the Mekong Delta. Um, and who, who knows what that looks like. But then you're going to see rare mineral resources, uh, challenges around, uh, you know, so we're seeing stuff in DRC and the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, some violence there right now related to this topic about who's in control, who wins, who, who controls access to those resources, uh, likely lithium resources, uh, bauxite um, to create things like aluminum. Uh, these are all going to be major challenges as we try and electrify all of our economies, with, like who, who, who can access it to do the electrification. Uh, and then we're seeing energy challenges, right? So, so what's going on, uh, you know, in Ukraine, the, 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 Europe trying to, to put, a, put some, some boundaries around its relationship with Russia, uh, the U.S. certainly putting boundaries around its relationship with Russia, trying to, to drive uh, uh, global, uh, global opinion around, <laughs> around Russia as, as, uh, as a rogue state. And at the same time, you see countries like China, you see countries like India absorbing the energy capacity from Russia. Um, so what we're seeing is probably a decrease in U.S. power moving forward into the, the 21st century and, and a shift in, in who, who, who has a say in what happens next, right? India is saying, hey, we're, we're a major and rapidly growing economy. We're, we have a say in what happens next. And if China's going to send us discounted energy, like what are we going to do, not take it? Makes a lot of sense to me. But this is a real, a real challenge to U.S.-China relations, that there's, there, there are third parties now involved that, that can absorb, even if China was to say, we don't want to buy this energy uh, that can absorb that energy. And, and so we're, we're moving into a very different, what's called multipolar order. Now, what does this have to do with the metaverse? That's, that's the interesting question. So when I think of the metaverse, I think about it much more broadly than uh, what are we going to do in headsets and, and kind of the Neil Stevenson snow crash, you know, ready player one world of the metaverse. Uh, to me, the metaverse or spatial computing is really about uh, taking 3D data, putting it into the virtual world, and considering how we can simulate things that happen over time. That, that's a very fancy way of describing what happens in a video game. You know, we take these 3D things, 3D information, we put it into a virtual world, and then we move around it in time and we shoot each other up or whatever you choose to do in your 3D game. Um, what happens when we start putting cities into these virtual worlds and we start looking at how do um, how does energy move across these cities? How do we manage uh, uh, traffic jams more effectively? Um, how do we look at the impact of weather patterns? How, how do we design cities so that they, we can put solar panels on, on the tops of the roofs and, and, and maximize the, the amount of energy that they capture over the course of the day. I, I'm just making stuff up right now. But, but as we start thinking about the 3Dification of the virtual world, the, what, what I call the 3D web, uh, we start to see, you know, perhaps the economy, you know, more and more of the economy moving into that world. Uh, certainly more of the value on, on these, we were talking about the power that, that the Googles, the Microsofts, the Baidus will have uh, in the future because they control the data centers. The, the power of being able to simulate and the efficiency that comes with that 
uh, I think it's going to become increasingly important and, and a source of national power. If you if you can do that, com- if you can't do that comp- compute, you you your national power is limited. Uh, the other piece that I was thinking about when we were talking about the U.S. China in the metaverse and and how it ties to to what's going on uh, in India is that the value of the metaverse is directly related to the quality of data that goes into it. As you expand the the amount of sensors uh, on the planet that are feeding data into this world, Right, whether it's depth cameras, 3D cameras, whether it's temperature sensors in your building, they're doing building information management, whatever it is. As you increase the number of sensors, you dramatically increase the threat surface, the security surface uh, of your metaverse, of, 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 of whatever it is you're trying to simulate. And so as you start looking at geopolitical competition and moving forward, you know, one of the ways that you can create uncertainty about the value of an economy, create uncertainty about the value of a product, is to create uncertainty about the quality of the data going. And so we're going to see that, that the ability to secure these cyber physical systems is going to be central to the US-China relationship. It's going to be central to the ability to grow in the metaverse. And I don't think that we've actually solved this security problem uh, uh, in, in the hardware stack. Uh, I don't think we've so- solved it uh, in the firmware. I don't think we've solved it uh, in the application layer and we haven't solved it on the network layer, right? And so we're gonna see some real challenge because, because this hardware has to live for 20 years, 30 years in the real world, oftentimes. You know, we're gonna see some real challenges moving forward into the future about exactly how viable kind of this 3D web metaverse uh, digital twin economy is when it can be selectively knocked out. Right. Uh, Jonathan, really appreciate you, you know, sharing your perspective, you know, right from, because I mean, it, it was so broad as, as a question, you know, right from India, China relationships <laughs> to, to the metaverse. But, but, but I, you, lo- you know, I love you. it though. It, yeah. it, got yeah. me, it got me thinking. You know? yeah, but, but really appreciate you sharing your insights. Yes, I think we're living in a very complicated world because there's so many dynamics which is playing out. You know, there is Web3, which, which, which talks about decentralization. The, the, it talks about taking the middleman out of the picture. The, there's, you know, the economic layer itself. You know, when we talk about fiat currency, you know, the in the metaverse, we be talking about digital tokens, cryptocurrencies, NFTs. So what's the next era is going to look like? Because I think you painted a very beautiful picture of how the metaverse is going to, you know, uh, help all businesses, especially, you know, the dig- the digitification of the world, you know, when you, you know, through digital twins and, and, and things like that, you know, or how or all businesses will be able to leverage. Uh, you, you, uh, you spoke about security also, but what's, what's the next era going to look like? Would you, would you have some kind of a strategy that you would advise, you know, businesses? So I, I guess on what timeline <laughs> is, is the question, right? In, in, in the 20 year future, right? Like, in, and we would have said this 20 years ago, right? And the, we would have said that the internet of things and robots and 3D printing and all, all this and AI would, would all be here. And, you know, in 20 years from now, we're saying the same things will be there. Right? I think it's a lot more realistic now than it was you know, in, in, in kind of the 2005 edition of the future. Um, but the, the questions are in, you know, A, on what time frame? And, and B, where are the points of control? So I think that, you know, there, there isn't a world in which the, 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 we were kind of talking about the IT economy, right? So, so the questions are, where is the data? How is the data validated? And then where is the processing? Those are the kind of the points of control. And then who controls the algorithms, right? So so where is the data? We're seeing that more and more and more data is being produced at the edge. Uh, We're we're seeing that the networks are not gonna be able to push that data 
into data centers and it's going to continue to get worse. I don't care what people say about 5G. Uh, the, the second piece is uh, we were talking about the processing. So we're going to see much more specialized processing at the edge of, of, of organizations, of networks. Uh, but we're going to also see that, that it's very hard to do AI in a distributed way across like that, across you know, operating systems, across multiple compute stacks. So we're going to see a lot of the, the kind of analysis layer, uh, the kind of the chat GPT layer uh, happening in the cloud, continuing to happen in the cloud, because that's where uh, consolidated data and the transformer models can exist, where you have enough compute power for them to exist. I think we talked about energy, so that's going to be a huge thing. So we're going to have Web3 and robots and all this stuff. Where does the energy come from? How does it get stored? Right? Whoever, whoever solves that problem is going to have a key, solve a key point of control. Uh, and then we were talking about algorithms, right? So right now, it seems like, you know, your, your AI company is kind of going to have a, a a huge value add. You know, you take a look at, at OpenAI and, and the, the $30 billion valuation of OpenAI at the moment. I mean, holy cow. I mean, that's a Fortune 50 company or Fortune 100 company. Out of nowhere. You know, is that true or is that hype? Yeah, you know, how quickly does that degrade? Because their leadership team seems to think that they've got to pull a party trick on the on the scale of GPT, like pretty much every year to sustain their advantage. Is that possible? I mean, that's the rate at which the stuff is going to commoditize. Can you monetize it in a year? I don't know. Um, and so when you think about your strategy moving forward, these are the things to think about. It's not just what's happening you know, at the top application layer, hey, can I create a cool button? Can I create a, a this? Can I create a that? Can I put something on the app store? It's how much of my value is getting sucked down by Apple or by Microsoft or by whoever else it might be, you know, by Google, right? Like how much of my, how much of the, the creativity that I put into the system, you know, is going to get sucked down by these large players. And I think it's going to increase. It's not going to decrease. And I think the amount of time in which we can differentiate is going to decrease too. And so when we think strategically as a software, as software companies, what does that look like? How do we play differently? Because in a world where, you know, being a niche player where no one wants to compete because you're, because the amount of stuff you've got to, figure out is too great well that's going to go away right there was a demo the other day that just blew my head about like a guy wanted to make a little website to make that made jokes and so he sketched the thing up uh took a picture of it and uh then 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 uh one of the open AI products turned it into a working website with the with the tool to make the joke on it Right, but that kind of thing is going to happen at scale. And that means that the differentiation of I put 30 people into coding a thing for a year goes away. Right, that moat goes away. So what does that look like? How do you play? You know, you have to play on a different on on, on a different playing field. Right. Yeah. Uh, so this so the, these disruptions. It is something I think the world needs to completely prepare for because I don't think we've got any idea of how it's going to, you know, disrupt us. You know, I mean, so my last question to you: You've been the global futurist at HP. You you you've written a book called Rogue Wave. So maybe a, a first, uh, if you maybe talk about some of your works that you have done at, at HP, and, and second, maybe uh, Rogue Waves, and maybe suggest some uh, approaches for businesses. And last, your advice to students. Yeah. So so I guess the first thing is uh, my book Rogue Waves 
It's available in English. It's available. It's, it's available in Chinese. It was the number two economics book in China, and it talks about how to think through these problems in your organization. So part of the reason I'm being so general and so broad in what I'm talking about is every organization is going to have a different answer to the question, right? Of what do you do in a world where where the the global order and, and trade mechanisms. Have shifted, and and what do you do in a world where having more labor or having put in more time into a product doesn't create differentiation, right? So so the book is, I think, the best book on how to do that, how to think about that, and it gets super specific on how to do that because when I was at HP. You know, I wasn't allowed to go and just kind of talk generally about the future as we're doing right now. I had to make very specific recommendations for the future of the company about where do we invest, where do we not invest today, to make、uh, better results in the quarter, but also to make better results on the decade. So we've got to start thinking about those two things simultaneously、uh, as leaders. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Really appreciate you taking time and being part of the podcast.、And、to my listeners, if you like what you see in here, then please press the subscribe button. Until next time, see you guys. Bye bye. Thank you, thank you, Jonathan. Really appreciate this. Thanks very much, Ed.